All right, it looks like we've hit 12 o'clock. Uh, we still have some people signing in, but to respect everyone's time, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. My name is Brett Better. I'm an attorney in Thompson Hines Labor and Employment Group in the Cincinnati office. I am delighted to introduce two other labor and employment colleagues who are also presenting with me today, fellow Cincinnati associate Mike Myers and a partner John Weimer, who is resident in our Atlanta office. For the next hour, we'll discuss uh, the increase in National Labor Relations Board activity over the past year and how those decisions are impacting employers. Uh, we'll also explore some of the areas we expect the NLRB to address in year 2024. Uh, if, you're in the, if you use the control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you can submit questions. Um, as a final note, so we always get this question. We will be sending a, recorded, a, re a record of the webinar and slides out to all the registrants after the program is over. So you will be getting a copy of those. And with that, I will go ahead and get started. So our webinar today is the NLRB update, looking back and planning ahead. The presenters today, as I mentioned, are myself, uh, Brett Vetter in the Cincinnati office and my fellow associate, Michael Myers, who's also in the Cincinnati office and John Weimer, who is a partner in our labor and employment practice group in Atlanta. So to get started on this NLRB refresher from 2023, I thought it would be important to talk about what the National Labor Relations Act is. Uh, so the National Labor Relations Act was enacted in 1935, and it's the basic law governing the relations between labor unions and employers. Uh, but the rights under the NLRA extend to non-union employees as well. So many people think if they don't have a union, they don't have to worry about the NLRA or the NLRB, but that is not the case. And with some recent decisions from the NLRB and the current administration and over the last year or so that those rights have been expanding uh, to non-union employees at a pretty significant rate. So it, you know, it applies to a lot of private sector employees as we'll talk about in a second. The NLRA is administered and enforced by the National Labor Relations Board and the General Counsel. And who does the NLRA cover? Um, well, it's a little easier to say who it doesn't cover, and the NLRA does not cover agricultural laborers, independent contractors, supervisors, as are defined under the National Labor Relations Act, doesn't apply to public sector employees, executives, railroad and airline employees, and certain other employees, but it does apply to most other private sector employees. And again, I just we just want to reemphasize, it even applies if the employer does not have a unionized workforce. There are rights under the NLRA that apply without the presence of a union. And that's been um, reinforced and expanded pretty dramatically over the last couple of years. Yep, Brett, let me just uh, interject two or three things briefly. One, I'm happy to say that I was not born when the law was passed in 1935, but without going into greater detail, it wasn't too much after that that I was. And <laughs> in, in the year 2020, uh, President, then President, uh, presidential candidate Biden promised to be the most pro-union president of the United States in American history. And, and he has fulfilled that promise. Regardless of your feelings politically, he has certainly made good on that. Second, when you see the list of, of people not covered, you see independent contractors. I can tell you that you should put an asterisk there because based on the NLRB's recent definition of what it is and is not an independent contractor, people who you might presently think are independent contractors are likely to be determined uh, to be employees by the, by the National Labor Relations Board. And then finally, just let me reemphasize the idea of, of a non-unionized workforce. I've given presentations around the country for a long time. And ever, whenever I talk about the NLRA, people always come up to the end and they say, you know, that was interesting, but we don't care about that because we don't have any unions. And you have to get that idea out of your head. It applies to everybody and it applies to you. Absolutely, thanks, John. Um, so what are the employees' rights under the NLRA? Uh, well, the NLRA grants the right to, for employees to self-organize, um, the right to form, join, or assist labor organizations, to bargain collectively through representatives, representatives of their own choosing or unions, and to engage in concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. So with that 
that idea of what the NLRA is, we wanted to talk about some 2023 unionization statistics. As many of you may be aware, there's been a lot of national media attention about unions recently with some several large companies, um, but that's reflected in the numbers as well. Uh, in 2020, 2021, there was around 900 to 950 to 1,000 union elections per year, and the percent won by the union was under 60% both years, with 58% and 54% respectively. That number has increased dramatically in the last two years with union elections of 1,400 and 1,482 in years 2022 and 2023, but also the percent won by the union has increased significantly as well. So not only are there more elections, but the union is doing a better job of winning those elections with 70 and 71%. So um, this is a pretty dramatic increase in just a few short years. And you know it's been exacerbated by a lot of things that we've seen in the media about unions recently. And significantly, these 2023 numbers do not include a recent uptick in voluntary recognition of unions in the wake of a 2023 decision from the NLRB called CMEX, which we'll talk about later. But essentially, it, it gets rid of the requirement for unions to have to um, have an election petition or have hold an election to create a union. Um, they can do it by a voluntary demand for recognition, but we'll, we'll talk about that more later. So. Some of the national media coverage that has um, focused on some union activity in the last year includes the Teamsters deal with UPS. Um, you may have seen that in the news. Average hourly rate increased to $49. Full-time UPS drivers will earn an average of $170,000 in annual pay and benefits at the end of their new five-year contract. And they also got air-conditioned trucks as part of their deal with the Teamsters. Um, we saw the first union at a major U.S. bank in decades with the employees at Wells Fargo, Albuquerque, New Mexico site successfully voting to form a union in December of 2023. And just this month, their Daytona Beach site also voted in favor of the union. And we expect to see a domino effect for a lot of different banks and branches um, in year 2024. Uh, there's been a number of unfair labor practice charges at many large companies, including Starbucks, which has been one of the main focuses of a lot of this media coverage. Over 80 unfair labor practice charges were filed against Starbucks in the last couple of years. And there's been petitions to unionize at over 200 Starbucks stores in 29 states. And this is all in, in the last couple of years and predominantly in 2023. Uh, you may have also seen on the news the United Auto Workers strike with the big three automakers. During that strike, there was about 146,000 uh, workers covered by those agreements, and they did. They staged their strikes and in, in sessions where a portion of the people would be on strike at a time, and it peaked at approximately 45,000 employees on strike at one time. Um, that that strike resulted in a deal that raised that raised salaries by approximately 25% for most workers, and a lot of the temporary workers are seeing raises as high as 160%. So there's been some objective success um, for unions in year 2023. And within the addition of the NLRA having some um, decision, or the NLRB having some decisions that really helps these unions and helps employees, all of these factors at once are combining to make um, 2024 look like it might be an even bigger year for unions and union efforts than 2023. Labor strikes in 2023, there were 423 labor strikes, uh, which amounted to almost half a million workers. Um, some of the major strikes included the UAW, as I already mentioned. The actors and screenwriters had a, approximately 60,000 members on strike, and people became very aware of that because if you're someone who watches Netflix or any other uh, streaming service, you you know many shows were delayed and seasons were not put out when they were supposed to be because of the strike. So that had a real impact on a number of everyday people that were aware of what was going on. And then 75,000 healthcare workers were on strike in California this year. So there's been a large number of strikes in addition to some um, major successes for unions in their contract negotiations with their employers. So in addition to just the, the general unionization effort, the NLRB has issued numerous decisions and new rules in 2023 that impact employers. Um, McLaren McComb, Stericycle, Miller Plastics, CMEX construction, which I mentioned briefly before, and they've also um, ordered had two new rules come out, a new election procedure rule and a new joint employer rule. So we're going to talk about each of these, the decisions and new rules from the NLRB in 2023. So the first one is McLaren-McComb, 
And in that case, a hospital in Michigan permanently furloughed 11 union employees and presented each with a severance agreement and release with the following provisions. Um, these confidentiality agreement and non-disclosure provisions are pretty standard or template as I would describe, as I would describe them. Um, for the confidentiality, the employees simply acknowledge that the terms of this agreement are confidential and they agreed they would not disclose them to any third person other than spouse or as necessary to professional advisors for the purposes of obtaining legal counsel or tax advice or unless legally compelled to do so by court. Um, nothing abnormal there if you're familiar with um, employment agreements or severance agreements, um, that, that was what they were presented. And then on their non-disclosure, the employer or the employee promised and agreed not to disclose information, knowledge, or materials of a confidential privilege or proprietary nature. Um, you know, you, you can read it there, but these are very standard and template um, confidentiality agreement and non-disclosure agreements as part of a severance. But the NLRB said that it is unlawful for an employer to offer a severance agreement that included such a broad confidentiality and non-disparagement provision because these provisions have a reasonable tendency to interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees in exercising their Section 7 rights and have a chilling effect on employees exercising those rights. Um, significantly, they didn't say that the execution of the agreement was unlawful, but it's unlawful for an employer to even proffer or offer one of these agreements to an employee. Um, as a reminder, this only applies to employees covered by Section 7 of the NLRA, so agreements when exec with executives exempt personnel, managers and supervisors, et cetera, those would be unaffected. But um, as we talked about earlier, there's a number of people that are covered by the NLRA that this would apply to. And I will say that, you know, oftentimes there's these template separation agreements that are provided to all employees. And it's typically not beneficial to be offering non-disparagement provisions to low level employees anyways. Um, but now in the wake of this decision, um, you're, you're not only risking whether or not it's enforceable, but there's also the, the complication that it might be an unlawful practice under the NLRA. So you could face an unfair labor practice from the board and difficulty you know, processing that, that complaint. So after that decision, the general counsel from the NR, NLRB issued some guidance on how they would process these cases moving forward. And the NLRB general counsel said that confidentiality clauses that are narrowly tailored to restrict the dissemination of proprietary or trade secret information for a period of time based on a legitimate business justification may still be lawful. And that non-disparagement clauses may be found lawful only where the clause is narrowly tailored and justified and is limited to employee statements about the employer that rise to the level of defamation as being maliciously untrue and made with knowledge of their falsity or with reckless disregard for the truth or falsity. So in other words, it's going to be very difficult to have template separation agreements for employees. Um, and narrowly tailored to restrict the dissemination of proprietary or trade secret, that's going to be very difficult to have, um, you know, one, one agreement you use for all types of employees. And the takeaway from this decision is any template separation agreement is gonna be risky and should be reviewed to ensure compliance with this decision. Um, and based on this decision, it's extremely likely that the NLRB will expand their rationale on this to other employment agreements, such as settlement agreements for resolving lawsuits or administrative charges. So any type of agreement with confidenti confidentiality or non-disparagement, we expect the NLRB to have similar decisions saying those would be unlawful to proffer to covered employees under the NLRA. Brett, we should probably add also, Brett, that the general counsel has opined, not officially, that that even non-compete agreements could be unlawful because if an employee is restricted from going to work for a competitor, that could chill the employee in his in exercising his or her Section 7 rights at their current place of employment. Correct. Absolutely. Thanks, John. <clears throat> So the next decision that came out from the NLRB this year that has some broad implications for most employers um, is they adopted a strict new legal standard for evaluating the validity of workplace rules. Um, so this prior standard came from the Boeing company, a 2017 decision under the prior administration. And it is, it is um, typical to see some flip-flopping between administrations on some of these policies, but you know the current administration has, or some of these decisions 
but the current administration has really been on a on a role of reversing anything from prior administrations, but also overturning quite a bit of precedent that goes back decades, not just the typical um, flip-flopping on minor issues that we see um, administration to administration. So under the Boeing decision, there were three um, categories of workplace rules. And the first category were rules that were lawful to maintain because the rule when reasonably interpreted does not prohibit or interfere with the exercise of NLRA rights and the potential adverse impact on protected rights is outweighed by justifications. Um, some examples would be insubordination, speaking for the company or nepotism. Uh, while there might be an adverse in fact, impact on protected rights from an insubordination policy, it's obviously outweighed by the justifications associated with this rule and does not reasonably interfere with the exercise of rights. And then category two, those were rules that the NLRB said um, warrant individualized scrutiny in each case as to whether they would prohibit or interfere with NLRA rights. That would be disparagement, speaking to the media or off-duty conduct. The employer would have to be able to show um, that it doesn't interfere with rights, or if it does, that it was outweighed by the justifications associated with the rule. And then category three rules were unlawful because it would not because they would prohibit or limit NLRA protected conduct with no business justification. So if the employer couldn't you know, show a business justification for the rule, then it was gonna be deemed unlawful if it prohibited or limited NLRA protected conduct. Hey Brett, just a quick second here. Somebody had a question. Sure. Uh, the, the asker wants to know, what about keeping confidential information confidential? Are you talking about for the McLaren McComb decision? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, that's that's all that's all the question says there. Well, I'm going to assume that it's going to be on the confidentiality provision of the McLaren McComb decision. Um, and they said going forward that the confidential confidentiality clause can be lawful if it's narrowly tailored to restrict the dissemination of proprietary or trade secret information. So what they're really trying to do is ban these broad um, confidentiality clauses but you know with the current nlrb the scrutiny on what is narrowly tailored to restrict the dissemination of prop proprietary or trade secret information is going to be uh, i would say extremely high and i wouldn't expect the nlrb to um, be very lenient towards employers in drafting these severance agreements that contain confidentiality clauses i don't know if you have any thoughts on that john yeah it you if, if it's Confidentiality is a very broad concept, which is why the board said, well, in certain circumstances. But for example, if an employer considers how much it pays as its employees as quote unquote confidential, then that information does not qualify for confidential under the National Labor Relations Act and the way the board does it. So it needs to be, for lack of a better term, really confidential as opposed <laughs> to something the employer simply doesn't want other people or other employees to know about. Right. So back back to Stericycle. Um, in that decision, the board said that the Boeing standard permitted employers to implement overbroad work rules that chill employees' exercise of their rights under the NLRA. Uh, under the new standard from Stericycle, if an employee could reasonably interpret the rule to have a coercive meeting, the general counsel will carry their burden and this is a significant part, even if contrary, non-coercive interpretation of the rule is also reasonable. So if there are two interpretations of the rule that are reasonable, one is coercive of their section seven rights and one is not, the board said that the general counsel will meet their burden if they can show that they'll meet their, bar their burden regardless. It doesn't matter if there is a non-coercive interpretation that's also, is reason also reasonable. Um, another significant part of the stereocycle decision said that employers may rebut the presumption by proving that the rule advances a legitimate and substantial interest and that the employer is unable to advance the interest with a more narrowly tailored rule. But the key part is the board will focus its analysis on the perspective of an economically dependent employee who contemplates engaging in Section 7 activity rather than a reasonable person. So when they're looking at whether or not the rule um, has, a has a coercive interpretation, they said they'll look at it through the lens of somebody who has an economic dependency on their job and at the company 
um, rather than what a reasonable purpose, reasonable person interpret the rule as coercive. So that is a very difficult standard um, for employers to, to meet and makes it very easy for the general counsel to meet their burden of showing that it was coercive. So the takeaways from Stericycle are employee workplace rules are scrutinized individually and at a higher standard than before. If a workplace rule is unlawful, employers require to timely remove, redact, or replace the unlawful language and post and distribute notices to employees acknowledging their violation and providing information about their rights under the NLRA. So obviously there's just this hiccup and headache if there is an unlawful finding of a workplace rule, but this could be especially problematic in discipline cases based on workplace rules if the workplace rule is deemed unlawful, as the NORB can use it as evidence of discriminatory animus, and it can also cause um, significant ramifications for employers during an organizing campaign, again, especially in light of the CMEX decision, which we're gonna talk about shortly. Yeah, let me add one other thing to that too, Brett. One, one of the questions employers might have is, well, how is the labor board gonna find out what my policies are? And the answer is, if there's an unfair labor practice charge filed, regardless of what is alleged in the charge, the board will ask the employer to provide a copy of its handbook, any policies and procedures, and the board, the, the local board agent will comb through those to see if they can find anything that's uh, arguably unlawful, lawful, um, and then cite that as an additional unfair labor practice. So it, they, they go on a fishing expedition to see if they can find something. And obviously with this standard, more times than not, they will find something that they claim uh, chills section seven rights. Thanks, John. Um, so the next case we're gonna talk about is Miller Plastics. Um, and for background, section seven of the NRA uh, established that the employees have the right to engage in protected concerted activity. So the covered, covered conduct has to be both concerted and it has to be engaged in for the purpose of mutual aid or protection. That's the standard for determining whether the conduct is protected under Section 7. An employer can commit an unfair labor practice if they interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees in the exercise of those protected rights. So Miller Plastics changed the, the standard for determining if there's a reasonable inference an employee was seeking to initiate, induce, or prepare for group action. So prior to Miller Plastics, the um, relevant case law was all state maintenance, which said there was five factors you need to look at to determine if there was that inference. And one was, was the statement made in an employee meeting called by the employer to announce a decision affecting wages, hours, or some other term or condition of employment? Does the decision affect multiple employees attending the meeting rather than just the single employee that made the statement? Did the employee who speaks up in response to the amount, announcement do so to protest or complain about the decision, or were they asking questions about how the decision has been or will be implemented? Did the speaker protest or complain about the decision's effect on the workforce generally, or to some portion of the workforce, or did they solely make their complaints based on how the decision would affect themselves? And then was the meeting the first opportunity employees had to address the decision? So the employer didn't have a chance to speak with other employees beforehand um, about how this decision might affect them or might affect the group. So prior to Miller Plastics, those were the five factors that the NLRB would consider to see if this person was engaging in concerted activity. But in Miller Plastics, they said that this five factor test is too restrictive. Um, they returned to a 1986 Myers industry standard which said the question of whether an employee has engaged in concerted activity is a factual one based on the totality of the record evidence. This is the first example of them of the NLRB not just overturning a decision that came out in the last five to 10 years with a different administration, but they went all the way back to a 1986 decision and said that this has to be looked at um, on a case by case basis and look at all the factors and that individual um, that, that individual instance to see if it was concerted activity. So the takeaways from Miller Plastic is whether an employee has engaged in concerted activity is fact specific. There's no longer these five factors that we look at to determine it, but the NLRB is going to look at everything that happened before that comment or um, other action by the employee was made. And as you probably have gathered from these last couple of decisions with the current NLRB, 
we expect that to be a very generous standard for employees with the NLRB typically finding um, almost any excuse to say that they were engaged in protected concerted activity when they made that statement. Uh, so with that, I would turn it over to John Weimer to talk about the CMEX decision that I've been alluding to throughout this presentation. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Uh, you, just by way of, of background and history, up until CMEX, the process for union organizing was well established and, and well known by labor and by management and by the board. And basically what would happen is either employees would contact the union and say, can you come in and help us organize? Or the union would contact employees and say, would you be interested in unionization? At that point in time, if there, if there was a connection between the union and the employees, uh, they would build an organizing committee. They would, the union would try to get employees to sign union authorization cards, saying that they want to be represented by we'll say Teamsters Local 525. Um, and then with that, the union would go to the employer and say, listen, majority of your employees have signed cards. We'd like you to recognize us. The employer at that point had two choices. It could say, okay, um, let me look at the cards, and if you do, we'll recognize you. Or the employer could say that we don't think authorization cards are a reliable indicator of union support or non-support so if you want to if you want to represent our employees you better go file uh, an rc petition uh, that's the only way we would will allow you know agree to recognize you is if we go through that process and then there'd be a campaign there'd be a secret ballot election there would be a vote and either the union got a majority or they didn't but there are a couple of things that are important there one is obviously the employer always had the right for there to be uh, an election. It could force the union to do it. And during that process, the period of time would go by where if the employer was previously unaware of the organizing activity, it then became aware of it and could, could launch a counter union campaign explaining to employees why, in the employer's view, they would be better off without a union um, than, than with one. But with CMEX, uh, the landscape didn't just change, it, uh, it, it moved uh, in an earth shattering way. Uh, and CMEX came out on August 25th of 2023. And under CMEX, a secret ballot election is no longer required in order for employees to be represented by a union. What the Labor Board said is that once an employer is presented with a verbal or a written demand for recognition, clearly stating that a majority of the bargaining unit with the, in which the union claims support has indicated it wants the union. The employer has one of two options. It can recognize and bargain with the union, or it can promptly file its own RM petition within two weeks of when that demand is made. Now, a couple of questions you might have is, well, how would the employer, what would the employer require the union to do? And according to the board, the employer can say, okay, you know, let's, let me see the cards. Uh, the board has said, the general counsel said, well, the, the union doesn't have to show the employer the cards. They can agree to have a neutral third party arbitrator look at the cards to determine whether or not a majority of employees have signed. Interestingly, during that period of time where you're making arrangements to have the cards counted by a neutral third party does not toll or delay the two weeks the employer has to file the petition. So if you go through that process, uh, it, then you may lose the right if it takes too long to file the petition if you're the employer. Also, keep in mind that the union is not going to ask for recognition unless it has a majority signed up. Unions don't file historically petitions for an, for an election unless they have at least 65 to 70 percent of the employees signed up. So, so having a card check to determine whether or not the employer is 
excuse me, the union's claim of majority support is true is going to be a failed strategy. So the employer's other option is to file uh, an RM petition within two weeks. If the, if the employer does not file the RM petition within two weeks, then the union is entitled to file an 8A5 uh, unfair labor practice charge refusal to bargain. And depending upon what happens, the board will then certify <clears throat> the union as the employee's collective bargaining representative. Now, one other question you may have is, uh, okay, if the employer files an RM petition and the NLRB holds an election, and a majority of the employees do not vote in favor of union representation, is that the end of it? And the answer to that question is no, that is not the end of it. If the union files an unfair labor practice charge and the board determines that during the campaign period, it's a period that they call the quote, critical period, end quote, if the employer commits unfair labor practices during that period of time, and the union files an unfair labor practice charge, the board, if it finds the charge, the, the employer committed the unfair labor practices, and we know to a high degree of likelihood the board will so find, then the board is authorized <clears throat> to throw out the results of the election and to certify the union as the employee's collective bargaining representative, even though a majority of the employees voted against the union. So when you think about, okay, eventually somebody's gonna to have to vote this union in if we're gonna have a union, right? And the answer to that is wrong. That is not necessarily uh, going to happen. Now, one of the most important things to keep in mind is, first of all, this, this is a monumental, monumentally important decision because it flips everything on its head. And to, to me, the most obvious question is, okay, John, we get it. This is scary stuff. What do we do about it? And the answer is that I believe that every employer that would, include, including some that never thought they'd have a union like a Wells Fargo branch bank in Albuquerque and one in Daytona Beach, if, if you really don't want to have a union, then I think the employer has to launch an ongoing, meaning continuous, proactive, positive, comprehensive employee relations program that, that focuses on good labor management communications and even more importantly, on good supervisors and managers who are trained in the importance of good leadership skills, good communications, with the ultimate goal of the employer to be that when the union knocks, the vast majority of these employees will see no need for it. And so supervisory training, communications, we've, we've talked about things like this. I've talked about them the entire time I've been a lawyer, and that's what labor lawyers do, um, and I've seen a lot of labor lawyers from other firms who literally try to scare clients to death. The sky's falling, you need to do this, you need to do that. It's really scary. Well, now it's time to be scared. And the sky may not be falling, but it's certainly not as hospitable as it used to be. And so in my view, that's what employers need to do, um, and they need to do it right away. But the last comment I'll make about the CMEX decision is in every union election, if there is going to be an election, time is critical. In the, the next slide, we're going to refer to quickie elections. Some other people refer to them as ambush elections, meaning the employer's going along, it doesn't know anything is happening, and then the next thing you know, you get a demand for recognition. And if there is a petition filed, Typically, an election will be held in anywhere from 18 to 22 days. Now, compare that to the situation 10 years ago, when if a petition was filed, typically the election would be held within 38 to 42 days. The employer always wants more time. The union always wants less time. 
because the union has has reached the peak of its support. The union, you know, the employer is 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 ambushed. Didn't know any of this was going on, and wants as much time as it can get to to, to deliver its message of why it makes no sense. And so, not only is the CMAX decision important because it may mean no election whatsoever, uh, or if there is an election, the board will disregard the results. But when we go to to this next topic, which I'm going to turn over to Mike, these things are going to happen very quickly, which is why the employer needs to be ahead of this train in terms of the preventative, proactive, ongoing, comprehensive employee relations programs that I talked about. Great, thanks, John. Um, just so everybody can see, uh, we've got the uh, <clears throat> the quickie election uh, rules, the new ones that are uh, effective uh, as of December 26, 2023. So um, very, very new uh, to everybody. And, you know, the way that these things are going to shake out, um, you know, people are going to start challenging the rules and, and, and that's when litigation starts and that's when some of these terms get defined. Um, you know, the common theme, as I see it, with respect to, to all of these new rules and with respect to the way that the board is currently formulated, is obviously very pro-employee, and the definitions are as broad as they can be. And so the way that those, those definitions are going to be uh, tailored essentially is, is through the litigation process and we're, we're going to see a bunch of that starting up soon um, to challenge some of these new rules. Uh, the, as John mentioned, I think the, the new uh, election rules are essentially just designed in order to, to vastly increase uh, the speed with which they take place, uh, preventing the employer from, from properly preparing. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not going to read all of the uh, the differences you can see on the chart there in front of you, uh, but as you can see, the the, the timelines are, are shortened uh, dramatically, and you know that's not going to to benefit an employer. That's just going to make to make their position uh, worse, and so we're not going to be as as prepared as as we used to be for these elections, um, which you know is the point uh, that the NLRB is trying to make here. Uh, go ahead, Brett. Uh, and so moving on there, there's also the joint employer rule um, as as defined by uh, the NLRA uh, is also, again, designed to uh, expand uh, the definition as to who constitutes uh, a joint employer. And so the prior rule uh, essentially said that in order for an employer to be deemed a joint employer, uh, the employment relationship had to, the joint employer would have to uh, directly or actually control some of the uh, terms and conditions of employment. Uh, that rule is, is, is gone and has expanded to include um, whether or not the alleged joint employer actually controls or exercises their control, um, but whether or not the existence of such control uh, is is there. And so, um, you know, what do we mean by that, Brett? If you move to the next slide, here are some of the, the basic terms and conditions that they're they're talking about. So if you as a uh, an alleged joint employer uh, set forth the idea that you have the ability to control any of these uh, terms and conditions that you see in front of you, uh, that's where the new rule comes in, and that's where uh, you can be deemed uh, a joint employer, whether or not you actually exercise any control over any of these terms and conditions is essentially irrelevant. If you purport to have the ability to do that, it's enough under the new rule. Uh, so what does that mean uh, moving forward? Uh, first and foremost, it's not limited to, to employers with unionized workforces. Um, the best example that we can give, uh, a union free employer uh, contracts with a third party staffing service uh, to provide workers who are already unionized or who in the process 
vote to become unionized uh, after engaging in their services with you, uh, the employer could then be <coughs> required to collectively bargain with them um, under the, the, the new rule, uh, regardless, <coughs> regardless of whether they actually control uh, any of the terms and conditions of employment. And so the employers who are particularly susceptible to this new rule include franchisees, uh, contractors, and employers who use uh, staffing agencies. And it's not just uh, bargaining obligations. One of the main um, points of, of liability is that a joint employer can, can also be held liable for unfair labor practices committed by the staffing agency, for example. So if your your staffing agency that you're utilizing, you know, commits an unfair labor practice charge, you as the joint employer can also be held liable under the new standard. Um, and so that's particularly concerning uh, moving forward. <clears throat> In order to prevent that, uh, review the relevant agreements that you use with, with these uh, staffing agencies and the like. Uh, to make sure you're, you're trying to mitigate uh, the risks associated with uh, your arrangements. Also review your own uh, practice uh, using these types of workers. Um, are your supervisors directly, or I'm sorry, directing staffing agency employees? Are they making disciplined determinations? Um, and again, under the new rule, even if you purport to have the authority to do so, you could still be held liable whether or not you actually have implemented any of those in the past. So what do we expect from the NLRB moving forward? Um, we don't expect any particular change from the current administration. So uh, it's going to continue down the path of, of pro-employee um, and some of the things that the NLRB has basically in its sites uh, involve captive audience meetings, uh, dropping adverse action requirements uh, in particular cases, uh, and more unionizing activity. Uh, go ahead, Brett. Uh, so captive audience, just to kind of refresh everybody's recollection, um, Section 8C of the NLRA, it guarantees the employer the right to uh, speak about certain union issues. Um, you know, for the past 75 years, uh, the precedent has been, even during uh, both political parties' administrations, that uh, these types of union uh, meetings are um, lawful. And so uh, moving forward, the NLRB is, is attempting to uh, overturn this, this precedent. Go ahead, Brett. The General Counsel issued a memo in 2022 uh, arguing that these mandatory meetings regarding the union opinions are in violation of the NLRA and that all they've been waiting for is simply a test case to, to challenge the legality of this. Um, the quote there is from the general counsel herself uh, and essentially, you know, she's alleging that having these meetings um, create that, that chilling effect that uh, we were talking about before. Essentially, if the employee feels like attending these meetings would subject them to discipline, um, they could uh, perceive that as a threat uh, and then would be in violation of the NLRA. Uh, and quite frankly, it, it's kind of surprising to us that they didn't find their test case in 2023. And so that's why we expect uh, them to, to pursue this in, in the coming year. Go ahead. Yeah, let, let let, let me give a couple of examples of what the typical captive audience speech is. Captive sure. audience speech is a term the board came up with, in my view, to connote the employer's oppression of the employees, because you think of captives, you think of people with their hands tied behind their back and they're bound and gagged where they have to listen to the employer. But what it really involves, typically when the employer finds out that there's a union drive, it, it holds what I call a card signing presentation, it calls the employees in, says, we found out that some employees are interested in the union, they're soliciting cards. Obviously, you have the right to join and sign if you want. You also have the same right to refuse to join and refuse to sign. Don't let anybody coerce you into signing. Don't let anybody trick you into signing. Um, so be careful before you put your signature on anything. Um, that type of 
a presentation, if the employees are all called in and, and, and said that, would be a violation or an unfair labor practice, according to the general counsel, when she gets that case. The same thing is true of what's of the so-called 25th hour speech. As you probably know, under current law, an employer cannot give a captive audience presentation to employees within 24 hours of the vote. So typically, at least 25 hours ahead of the vote, the employer, that's, that's the deadline, to call the employees in and sort of cap the campaign, talk about themes like strikes, union dues, uh, what bargaining's about, nothing's guaranteed. And that 25 hour speech would also be an unfair labor practice if the general counsel gets her ways. And those are two of the most powerful primary methods that employers have of communicating their message. And this, of course, would take that away from them. About the only thing the employer could do would be make attendance voluntary. Um, and so that would be an approach, but uh, that's this, this goes to the heart of an employer's ability to communicate to employees about its its views on unionization. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, great. Thanks, John. Those are all, all great points. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, and so the, the last thing uh, that we see kind of coming down the pipeline is, is the removal of an adverse employment action uh, requirement in certain cases. Uh, so currently, in order to demonstrate anti-union discrimination, uh, it, it requires that the employees show that they suffered some sort of adverse employment action um, with respect to you know, their union affiliation. And you know, most of the time those involve termination, suspensions, demotions, some forms of disciplinary action. Um, and again, just a couple of months ago, general counsel uh, asked for a change in that standard uh, where the employer doesn't even have to take an adverse employment action, uh, but in some other way interferes with uh, the workers' rights. And the best example that we can come up with so far um, is, you know, a promotion of a worker from, you know, a frontline worker into more of a management position uh, with the intent to remove them from the bargaining unit. But again, you know, this is a, it's a pretty broad standard and so, you know, the only way that we're going to be able to work that out as to what constitutes, um, you know, an, an action with animus, anti-union animus is, is through the litigation process, which is, is still going to be, have to be worked out if, if this ever comes to fruition, which uh, general counsel seems to, to be urging the NLRB to, to do. And so uh, that's something else to, to kind of keep in mind is that um, it's not going to require some sort of uh, tangible example of of discrimination in order for these claims to be uh, validated. Go ahead, Brett. And so uh, the final thoughts that we have, um, the current NLRB is extremely pro-union and pro-employee um, and continues to demonstrate that over and over again with their decisions, uh, expanding the scope let me interject one thing, Mike, about this, just to, to make it as granular as possible. Sure. You know, we're not just saying that. There, there are five, there's supposed to be five members on the, on the NLRB, three Democrats, two Republicans. There are presently only four members of the NLRB, three Democrats and one Republican. And what that means is when the board breaks down into three member panels, it is to state the obvious, mathematically impossible for Republicans to ever have a majority of those three member panels. And that is how stacked this deck is. And it's, and it's obviously done intentionally because the president has decided not to renominate anybody for the expired Republicans term and just let it sit at three to one, which is as stacked a deck as you're gonna find. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and so, you know, Obviously, depending on, on what happens in 2024, um, we can expect this trend to continue. Um, 2023 was a significant year for the unions, um, pretty much in all respects, not just not just with respect to the, the record number of, of contracts secured and the, the amount of those contracts, but um, in general, especially considering overturning a past president uh, and things like that. And we expect that this kind of momentum is going to uh, is going to continue. Um, I think, as John hit on uh, before, uh, 
the decision in, in Semex was was substantial for for a number of different reasons, and it will lead to the unionization of, of many industries that were previously unaffected. Um, and so we're expecting to see more record contracts and just tangible objective success of, of union organizations uh, that that could you know, take hold across the country. Um, and that's you know essentially my final thoughts. I don't know if Brett or John, you guys have anything more to add? I, I don't, unless there's some questions. I was going to say, I don't think I see any questions and I don't have anything to add. And if you don't, John, I just want <clears throat> to thank you for every, thank everyone for attending. Um, if you have questions that you weren't able to submit that you would like to get addressed, please email or call your regular Thompson Hein lawyer. If you're not a Thompson current Thompson Hein client, please contact one of us and we would be happy to discuss available options to address your needs. I'll reiterate that um, a recorded copy of the webinar will be sent to all the registrants as well as the slides that we use during the presentation. Um, but other than that, thank everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.